there's a lot of good stuff that I want to go over because we're talking about Richard Rose's material. And I don't think there's a, a richer treasure trove of spiritual material than Richard Rose has left behind. Um, whenever I talk about spiritual matters, I don't get very far into it before I hear myself quoting Rose or recommending something that I first learned from Rose. Um, and he also had this extraordinary ability to encapsulate key spiritual strategies into a few words, a few memorable words that had a tendency to lodge in your mind. And that's what I'd like to do this morning is go over ten of those key strategies that I think together express the essence of Rose's teachings in maybe 50 words. Excuse me, I'll get rid of some of the extraneous materials here. Oh, sorry, I'm going to stop the microphone. <coughs> And all of these words, as with most everything that Rose had to say in one way or another, had one purpose, and that was to light a path to the absolute. As it happens, these strategies are also useful in daily life, but that wasn't their intention. Uh, Rose had no interest in helping people live a more comfortable life or become better robots. People who came around looking for that sort of thing usually didn't stay very long. Rose's core teachings are directed at people who at least suspect that their basic problem can never be solved on the level of the problem and that a great leap is in order. His teachings are based on the premise that extreme spiritual effort is necessary to have a good shot at enlightenment. They also caution that there's no recipe for a lightning bolt. In other words, there's no direct cause and effect relationship between our efforts and enlightenment should it occur. Which begs the question, so why should I exert any effort at all? Well, because statistics show that it increases your odds somehow. Now, there's a lot of neo-advaita and non-dual teachers these days and teachings that teach that there's no one here to do any seeking and that there's no effort required to become that which you already are. And it's absolutely true. Those words are absolutely true. You are most definitely already and always that which you seek. It's the absolute truth. But a fat lot of good that does you if you don't know it. The hard facts are that almost every occurrence of realization has occurred to someone who actively worked and prayed for it over a number of years sometimes a lot of years. Don't look at me. <laughs> the mechanism at work is a mystery, but the pattern is observable. So if we're serious about this enlightenment thing, it seems like a good idea to plug into. As Rose said, enlightenment is always an accident, but there are ways to make yourself more accident prone. So the recommendations we'll talk about this morning are by no means a recipe for a lightning bolt, but they may help you become more accident prone. I debated how to organize this, and I decided to uh, fabricate a little suspense by going with the Letterman Top Ten format. Mm. Even though the numbers I assigned are absolutely meaningless, um, none of these strategies are inherently more important than any other. None is a prerequisite for any other. Um, and in fact, if you investigate any of them deeply enough, you'll find that they include and imply all the others, as well as 20 or 30 other Rose quotes and uh, pieces of advice that we could have included in this talk. Um, there's really only one strategy. I don't want to spend too much time on the prepared remarks because I think the best stuff often comes out of discussion, but I want to say enough to spark some questions and then we can get into the areas that are most interesting to you. But enough caveats. All right, here we go. Richard Rose's top 10 tips for serious seekers. Number 10, <laughs> make a decision and carry it out. This is one of those sleeper recommendations that seems too obvious and mundane to have much spiritual value, but it's deceptively powerful. It taps into a fundamental principle that once you make a decision, and commit to it, the universe conspires to make it happen. Making and keeping commitments is the mechanism by which you build a vector, any vector, spiritual or otherwise. And until you've built up the habit of following through on commitments to yourself and to others, making a decision and carrying it out, you'll continue to cave and equivocate whenever times get a little tough. 
Rose's life is full of stories about his hard-headed insistence on following through on commitments, no matter how big or small, no matter what the risk. Uh, he was once thrown from a spooked horse in a blizzard and held on for a half hour while he got dragged all over the farm in the snow because he refused to let go. He could have got off at any time, he said. But when he took that horse out into the dangerous storm, he made a commitment to himself and to the horse that either both of them were coming back or neither was. And so he held on. Now, some would say that this kind of you know, unequivocal, maybe insane commitment, you know, is foreign to us. We've dropped off at the first opportunity, said, well, it's the horse's fault for throwing me, you know, the storm's not really that bad, you know, he'll find his way back. And all of that may even have been true, but to Rose it was beside the point. He'd given his word, <coughs> end of story. And he made a point of telling these kinds of personal stories to inspire others to adopt the same principle. He said, if this sort of thing comes hard to you, just start slow. Make a commitment to walk around the block every day for a month and then keep it. Build from there. Why is this ability important? Because in the context that we're talking about things this weekend, if you're serious about having a shot at enlightenment, somewhere along the line you're going to have to commit to it. And if a person who has a habit of following through on commitments makes a commitment to discover the truth at all costs, there's a good chance that something might happen.